So we are here with uh, Kip Winger today. How you doing, Kip? Good. How are you? Good. Very good. So I've been listening to an advanced copy of your new album, Better Days Coming, and um, I got to tell you, not only is it good, it's so good that I went over and bought the Japanese import so I could have the extra two bonus tracks because I need more of it. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so, so so let's talk a little bit about this album. It It seems... To me, at least, somewhat more aggressive than than songs you've done in the past. And by aggressive, I just mean you know faster, more rock, not not in terms of messaging. And also, you know, at times I sort of felt like I was listening to the Police's Synchronicity album on steroids. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, tell me about the album. I appreciate it. Um, you know what? Every time Reb and I sit down to make a record, it's exactly the same process. Right. We you know, put up a drum beat and start coming up with riffs. And, you know, the thing is, is that we we all like working together a lot. We like to hang out. We have a lot of fun. So it's not, it's not a difficult thing to sit down with these guys and, uh, you know, make a record. It's, it's quite fun and comes very naturally so right. this record was no different i mean we sat down and we you know wrote a bunch of riffs and you know we we know when we have a good riff and we kind of go from developing that even from all the way back to 17 when rev started 17 right he's like i don't know what to do with this riff, you know so we put that together and so it's been the same ever since we like i say we can come up with a drum beat and then we um, record, you know, just different ideas. And, and I'm kind of, you know, my my part of the job is arranging. And I know pretty instantaneously whether it's workable or not. And, you know, and then the process goes pretty fast. And on this record, we were coming off the heels of Karma, which was five years ago, which is yeah, 2000 weird because I, I don't know where the time went, to be honest with you. Um, so we, you know, we did, and we felt like, you know, Karma got a great reception, and we didn't feel like we had anything to prove. We just wanted to do the best work we could and have a lot of fun doing it. And like I say, it's very natural, so we never get in a situation where we can't come up with ideas. Some days are better than others. Some ideas are better than others. But usually uh, we don't put anything up on the operating table if we don't know it's an A you know, an A riff rather than a B riff. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, like I say, this process was the same as it always was, and we just, uh, you know, try to do the highest quality thing we can do. Well, you really, you succeeded, I gotta say. I mean, um, you know, the first song, Rat Race, and then Midnight Driver of a Love Machine, just fantastic rock. So, so, there, was, so there was no effort or, or thought into we have to make a more hard rock album. I mean, this is just what came out naturally. Um, no, did you hear Karma? I did. Yeah. I think in fact, I have it. So Karma was, Karma, Karma was pretty heavy. Um, and we wanted to keep, we, you know, we feel like the, as you know, it's always a work in progress. As time goes on, we're honing the sound of the band more and more. And we're, and, and, and I still am conscious of trying to get the best out of each guy playing wise so um and the the cool thing about music is that it always is changing and it's never the same so uh you know my job as the as the acting producer of it is also to 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 know these guys better and better as the years go by and try to you know hone the actual personality of them right. musically so I think this is a one, you know, more. It's a, it's a it's a further extension of that. And like I say, you know, after Karma, we were like, well, we've done pretty much the whole thing of what we do. So let's kind of do a little bit of each uh, element of what the band does on this album. Like I say, it happened quite naturally. We didn't right. sit down and go, let's make an album that embodies the whole band. <laughs> it just kind of 
happened and when I when it all happened I realized well this there's a little bit of everything on here everything that we've ever done right on this album and I like to keep it heavy because listen we're not heavy by today's standards I don't think I mean you no, know no obviously the not. death metal bands are much heavier than we are um, but what we do is try to stay true to the what you know in my mind it's late seventies music because um, we all draw upon the the you know kind of the 70s bands in our mind and then you know we're 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 labeled as an 80s band so there's certain things that go along with that we have that style and uh we stay within that style but try to move it forward yeah you, you really did um the question i have though is you know like you just said you're an 80s band you could probably go across the states or europe and do a tour without any new music you could go play i'm 17 and madeleine and all those why why make a new album what what's the inspiration or what's the purpose in making a new album it seems to be almost a passe kind of art form no that's an interesting question um well for me you know my life is dedicated to the study of music right. and understanding music. So I have a band of players that's just, you know, amazing. And I feel honored to be in the band with those guys. And so it's always fun to, and writing music is basically the whole definition of my life. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about me personally, but I have kind of three distinct areas that I've just, that I've intentionally focused on, which right. are winger, right. classical music, and yes. the Kip Winger solo stuff. So the, between those three things, and so it's all you know, you make new albums. I mean, everybody does it. Paul McCartney continues to make new albums. Why, you know, why why would he do that? He could certainly go out and play Hey Jude every night. You're right. And people would love it. So I think, you know, it's the nature of an artist to want to create something new, basically, is the answer to that question, you know. You well, don't, and the reason you don't I... Just, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, the reason I asked the question is uh, twofold. First, I look at some of the, the bands that were grouped in with you in, in the 80s. Cinderella, haven't done anything in God knows how long, and yet they still tour. Uh, Poison, haven't done anything in God knows how long, and they still tour, etc., and then, you know, everybody these days go on and says, well, the internet and people downloading and there's no point. And, uh, you know, even Dee Snyder says, oh, well, uh, you play a new song in concert and that's called a pee break. Uh, so there seems depends to be... On, depends on how good the song is. Yeah. Well, that, I guess that's it. So, <laughs> you know... So for you, it's this important. Is, this, is for, this is for people that are replete for ideas. Right. <laughs> so... I mean, hey, I watched G. I I did a benefit with D not too long ago, and he he tore it up. The guy's amazing. But, oh yes. you know the new songs. I you know I I don't know what to tell people about you know uh, writing is the focus of my life, and I want to and I don't want to put out crap basically. You know, so um i think being a good self-editor is key and uh keeping a real high standard you know yeah you, I, you know i'm gonna have to agree with that in terms of high standard because uh I, you know i get sent albums like 5 10 20 albums every week to listen to and this winger one really spoke to me i mean it really was one of the better rock records i've heard easily in the last six months, if not the last year. I mean, you really, you did, really did a fantastic job. Um, I appreciate that. Let, let's talk about Reb Beach a bit. He's, or at least he was, I don't know if he still is, but he was he was off doing the stuff with Whitesnake. Um, is he taking some time off of that, and is he going to be touring with you this year, or what's the situation with Reb? The situation with Reb is that he is a full member of Whitesnake, and uh, they're, on a, they're on a break, and I'm a big White Snake fan. I think Coverdale is one of the great singers of our time, Agreed. and uh, yeah. have a great respect for that. And he's been gracious to uh, make the schedules workable. I mean, you know, we all have a lot of other stuff going on. Rod's a full professor at Berkeley. John yeah. Roth is in Starship. I've got uh, two separate careers outside of this, basically, yeah. and. So on this album, we, you know, we, it, it was the timing that White Snake was off, and we all 
uh, wanted to get together and really make a go of, of playing a lot of live shows, as many as we can. And so, you know, that's kind of where it's at. There's a few scheduling conflicts, but for the most part, we're all uh, on the page to support this album. And what is, you know, rigorously. What does the what does the touring schedule look like for 2004? Is it sort of a few American dates, or are you going to try to get a little more worldwide and hit Europe and Japan and maybe Canada? We're going to England in uh, we're going to England in June. Okay. And we played Japan with Y and T last uh, about two months ago, and we'll hopefully go back there in October. And um, you know, Canada. We need to play there. We haven't uh, we haven't done anything there in a while. And South America. You know, all the yeah. we hit all the all the places. You know that people play. I mean, it's very interesting with our band. I mean, the perception of our band. We're I like to refer to us as the most misunderstood band in rock. <laughs> well, I do agree, and I, and I do want to get to that with, with all that MTV stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, you my, got, you... Well, my point in bringing that up is that you know, some places it's easier for us to get gigs better, more than others. You know, so. Um, but I, I definitely, we, in my mind, there's only one answer in the music business for a gig, and the answer is yes. <laughs> so yeah. we get invited. You know, we play unless it's just not financially doable, but. Yeah. You know, I mean, look, there, there's no, there's no holding up facade here. I mean, you know, the music business is not what it used to be. So, you know, you, you hope for the best, really. Yeah. And it's time that you get back to Canada. I, I think the last time I saw you, because I'm in Montreal, the last time I saw you here was probably on the... Kiss Pull Tour, 93, wasn't it? It could have been, but I think I only saw you on the Kiss Hot in the Shade Tour. You were opening up, right? No, so, we definitely played Montreal in '93 on the on the pole okay, tour. Yeah, um, see, no, I missed that one, but but I saw you more recently than that. I saw you on the uh, Poison tour, but that was 2004, 2003, something like that. 2002. But, 2002. Wow, boy, time flies. Um, now, before you mentioned '70s bands, and you of course worked with and for. One of the 70s greatest American icons, Alice Cooper, back in the early 80s doing, uh, you know, uh, Raise Your Fist and Yell and Constrictor. Um, what can you tell me about those days and working with Alice? Alice is an absolute genius. I mean, he's very gracious. Right. He's incredibly smart, very funny, sings better than he has. I mean, he's at the top of his singing. I mean, I played done a couple benefits with him lately where he's just his voice sounds amazing yeah um i love playing the songs because i was a huge fan when i was a kid as a matter of fact i did an interview with the uh, bass player magazine not too long ago and i and, you know dennis dunaway the original bass player the original Alex, baser, was yeah. he was very one of my top three influences yeah mel shocker from grand funk and uh uh, Dale Peterson from the James Gang, you know, I'm like, I grew up in a three-piece, where, you know, I was very influenced by the three-piece bands, but, I mean, Alice was in a three-piece. No. So, you know, Alice, uh, very generous guy, giving to the community, he's got a lot of charity stuff mm -hmm. going on. I mean, like I say, he still sings his ass off. You know, the whole Alice Cooper world is... It just continues to grow into, you know, this amazing empire. He's, but he's very down to earth. I mean, he's not a uh, very approachable guy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know? I mean, I consider him a, a pretty good friend. I mean, uh, we don't see each other a lot, but when we do, it's just like, you know, it's cool. I just recently played on stuff he's doing. And, and you played on uh, uh, Welcome to My Nightmare 2. I did, yeah. Bob Ezrin is uh, was a huge hero of mine, and he lives here in Nashville. Right. He was producing that, and uh, I was telling Bob, you know, Bob, see, when I was a kid, I'm a self-taught musician, so right. but when I heard Eleanor Rigby and 
you know, the strings on Desperado by Alice Cooper, I was thinking, well, I, I have to know how to do that, you know, so, you know, Bob Ezrin is, is one of the big influences on the reason why I even write orchestral music, so, oh, that's interesting. I've been really lucky, I've been really lucky to work with a lot of my heroes, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's fun, man, it's a nice uh, payoff. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Bob Ezrin because, you know, Pink Floyd, The Wall, Kiss Destroyer. He did the last Deep Purple album. Uh, the man's a genius. Uh, well, no, he yeah, I mean, he's he's blue blood American. He's our equivalent to George Martin. I mean, that's, yeah. that's all you got to say. I mean, he is the guy for, you know, the top of the line producers of, of, of this, this kind of a, generation so we have some blue bloods you know alice cooper yeah. bob ezrin steven tyler and kiss of course these guys are our rolling stones so you know i'm lucky to you know kind of uh, be able to know these people and play music with them and stuff and play with them yeah but now if i can just go back though how was it in the 80s because alice when when you joined you know, he was coming off uh, Flush for Fashion, Data, these albums that weren't doing so good. He had lost so much weight that he that he was almost looking like he was walking death. And then he slowly started to build up, and you get in a band with Kane Roberts. And what was, was there any kind of pressures? Was it sort of this, if, if we don't make it, Alice disappears from the face of the earth? Uh, and, and then also, why at some point did you decide, okay, I got to go out on my own. I got to go do winner. Why not just stay in, in, in Alice's uh, band? Well, um, so, so Alice was in good shape when I met him and, and uh, started playing with him with Kane Roberts. They, he, was, he was fully recovered. Right. So I never met him in the down times. Right. Uh, there was a lot of energy. There was a lot of optimism. Um, Kane Roberts was actually the reason I'm in the band. I, I got, uh, well, Bo Hill, actually. Bo Hill was producing, and I'd known Bo for a long time. I'd actually, you know, I, I kind of assisted him on some stuff, and he produced my band when I was in Colorado. I was probably the first band he ever produced, actually. Right. And Had you assisted Bo so, with the rat stuff? No, but I mean, I, you know, I'd worked with him for 10 years okay. by the time he got that gig. Rat was, you know, self-contained. Uh, I mean, but when he needed bass tracks on a record he was producing or something, he'd usually call me. So he called me on the Alice. I did four songs. I was a huge fan. I knew all the music. Right. Um, and Kane suggested that I mention I'd be willing to go on the road, and they called me to go on the road. I didn't audition or anything, and they just... And then basically Kane, who was the musical director, and I, he was the musical director, but I was already in the band. I was, I was the guy, the first guy that got picked outside of that. And then Kane and I auditioned everyone else. And, uh, you know, they were expecting to go out three months, and it was a big success. And they, and they stayed out for about a year, which was me. I got to be in the band and take notes about what it was all about on that level. And it was... Uh, you know, I think Alice is a force to be reckoned with. There was no way he was going to fail after getting himself back up and running. I mean, he he's just had too huge of a legacy, right. you know. I mean, even the bottom of the barrel of a legacy like that's going to look like success to anyone else. So, you know, we had a great time, and uh, I'd always been interested in doing my own thing, though. And Alice was the first one to give me his blessing. Um, yeah. So everybody else kind of in the organization was kind of taken aback that I left after that because they were putting together, you know, another tour and it was going to be big and it did very well. But, you know, I felt like I, that was my time to jump and if I didn't do it then, I didn't know when I would do it. And so I just took a shot and luckily things turned out the way they did, but I already known Reb and Reb was amazing. And so we knew, Reb and I knew we had a chemistry and, I thought win, lose, or draw, you know, I got to take a shot. Yeah. yeah, and it turned out quite well. Um, I did it my way. You did it my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you absolutely did. Are you proud of those of those Cooper records that you played on? 
Hell yeah. Although Michael Wagner turned the bass down too far on that Rage of 15 <laughs> record, man. I'd like to remix that. Yeah, um, so yeah, no, I am, man. They did. We had great fun. It was really, a, it was a blast making them. And Ken Mary's an amazing drummer. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. And you, and you must've learned so we, a lot also through all the theatrics and, and how to put, put together a show. I mean, it must've been a quite a learning experience. It was, it was, it really was, I have to say, um, some things still haven't sunk in to this day, honestly, <laughs> but we're still friends. I mean, I talk to Kane all the time, you know, Kane and I talk three or four times a week. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I, I, I learned a lot. I really did. So, um, I really owe that whole organization a lot. Um, of gratitude for including me on that whole thing. Yeah, uh, I can just imagine. Now, uh, just getting back to uh, better days coming. Uh, so the album, the album's coming out. Uh, you know, you're going to you're going to go on tour. What does that mean afterwards? Are, are you currently working on another uh, classical album? Are you currently working on another solo album. I mean, the last one I have from you, I think is down incognito. That's the last solo album I have from you. Oh, well, from, from the moon to the sun. Yeah. Uh, I missed a couple from the, yeah, no, well, there's one called from the moon to the sun. And I don't know the uh, songs from the ocean floor. I can't remember if that came out before down incognito down incognito was really just a remake of right. Existing songs done acoustic. That wasn't, I don't really consider that one of the records. Um, okay. I have uh, this conversation seems like a dream. Songs from the ocean floor and from the moon to the sun. And I'm uh, collecting ideas for the new one. It's a whole different process, you know. It's it's ideas that I've written that are in a certain kind of in a certain vein, and I collect them all. And then, you know, it's a whole other approach. Yeah, it's got to be a so. writing for for a band situation and writing for just yourself has got to be a, a whole different mindset i would imagine it is and uh you know i i, I dig it. it i it's really a matter of, of timing i just don't have a lot of time because i'm doing a lot of other stuff i'm I'm writing a lot of i'm working on a, a piece right now uh, for a friend of mine with classical music and so you know that takes a while but i'm also you know, doing a lot of interviews for this album, getting ready to promote. We're going on the Monsters of Rock cruise in a couple of days, and you know, we're doing a lot of shows this summer. So, I mean, I have to just squeeze it all in on the off days that I'm not working on the winger thing because right now we're we're doing uh, all the time is is towards the winger record. Can I, I can just imagine, and uh, and then I'll just ask you quickly about the your sort of your biggest single, Seventeen. Um, is it hard to sing that song now? No, not it, ironically. No, I mean it's hard to do a whole set of this music, right? If you don't take care of your voice and stuff, like, but I mean, I don't drink and I don't smoke or anything, so that helps. Okay. Some people, some people can drink and smoke and still sing their asses off, uh, um, but not me. So I do my best to take care of my voice. Uh, just because uh, I don't want to be the guy up on stage that everybody in the audience is going, geez, look what happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, if you take care of yourself, you know, it's not... The main thing, singers, you know, it's easy to blow your voice out if you're singing too hard, but I can still sing. I mean, knock on wood. Yeah. I've, had, I've had some... I've had a lot of off gigs, you know, of course, where you get up there. I mean, singing... Singing is tough, man, because it's not like an instrument. You can tune up the strings, and as long as you've got new strings on there and they're all stretched out and you know it's going to basically be in tune, you know, the voice is, is a whole other animal. You never know really what's going to come out. Do you take any special precautions? You're not doing uh, cortisone shots, and you haven't had nodes, and you're not... Do you do the I don't talk on, on show days kind of prep? or No, I just... 
No, I mean steroids are horrible. I mean that's yeah. only if you're in, if you're in an emergency situation. I've never had nodes. I just okay. had my voice looked at. It's like a basically the same as when I was 19. But um, I have asthma, so that's a little bit of a trick. But um, okay. I don't know, man. I, I I studied voice for a long time, man. So I mean, I I I do a lot of things to keep my voice healthy, but I'm not obsessed with it or anything. Um, you know, I just try to be reasonable. Talking isn't good, but you know, I mean, everybody, listen, it's a very individual thing. Everybody's got their own voodoo about how to do your voice. I just try to stay away from the booze and the smoking and all that shit. Um, so it's not too big of a deal. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I got to say, you, 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 you do sound great. I mean, it's not, like, it's not like Steven Tyler, man, you know, 65 years old and he's still singing Dream On in the original key. I mean, that guy's, you know, off the hook. I mean, I have a baritone voice, right. you know, so I'm singing above my natural register. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of guys out there tearing it up. Yeah. The, uh, the, and then the last thing I'll ask you about is, of course, huh, back in the 90s, Metallica puts out a video, Nothing Else Matters, where they're throwing dartboards or darts at your face, and of course, MTV with Beavis and Butthead. Do you laugh that off now, or did that really hurt in, in terms of career-wise and, and just, hey, what are they doing well, to me? Well, it didn't help. I mean, but you know, I've asked, you know, people have asked me that question for like 25 years. I yeah. mean, really, you'd have to ask Lars. Why? Somebody should just ask him why. I mean, I don't, I don't know why. I never met him. I mean, I, I was a fan of a few of their records. I thought they made a few good songs and some good records and stuff. Um, everybody I know always goes, Lars is such a shitty drummer and all that. But I, <laughs> I listen to his drumming. I think he's quite good. I yeah. mean, I like, I like the way he thinks about drumming. Um, I got nothing against the band. It didn't help us. I, I'm, not, I'm not into slagging other bands. I just think it's unclassy. I don't know. You'd have to ask those guys. About yeah. That. Um, but I'm just thinking as far 20. As Beavis and Butthead, what's that? I was just saying that. I was just thinking that 25 years later, at some point, you, 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 you probably just laugh it off now and just look back and say, eh, you know, that was silly. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's just part of our legacy. It just right. is what it is. I mean, what are you going to do? Like, uh, I talked to Mike Judge on email not so long ago, and, and I, I think it just was the luck of the draw, honestly. I don't think we actually were. They singled us out because it was like anything other than let's pick a band from this genre, and maybe we were popular at the time, so our name came up. You know, when you drew, you, you draw straws or something. Right. Draw straws or something like that. But, you know... Um, it's just part of what the band, the part of the band's legacy, really. I mean, for for any answers, you'd have to ask those guys what the deal is, you know, Mike Judge and all that. But um, I thought Beavis and Butthead was really funny. I we ended up on the wrong end of the show, but and and it definitely didn't help us at the time. Um, and I like I say, it 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 it, it goes to say that our band is very misunderstood. I think. And, yeah. Uh, but I just think that like 25 years later, in a, in, in a weird way, it's sort of a, a fun promotion for the band because, who, you know, nobody else remembers any of the other bands that were mentioned on Beavis and Butthead. Nobody else remembers anything of that Metallica video. And yet, you know, Winger is there and it's, it's, it's sort of a strange promotion. Like Gene Simmons always said, I don't care what you say as long as you print the name right and get the picture posted, right? That's, that's true. That's that's definitely true. It was a little different with Beavis and Butthead because it was literally like ushering a new, ushering in a new genre of music, and where we were selling a lot of records very quickly. We weren't selling any records, and it, and we couldn't really get a gig even. So, um, but that was probably true for Poison, for Cinderella, for Rat. I mean, there was a lot of bands. There was a lot of bands, and for me, honestly speaking, it it it, it opened up a whole. Uh, time that I could study music, and that's really where I got my orchestra chops together. Right. You know, so I had a lot of time on my hands, and I used it as wisely as I could, and came out on the other end. You know, having achieved a goal set that I'd had since I was young about being able to write organically for an orchestra and stuff. And now I'm getting some orchestra plays, and 
I don't think I would have been able to do it had I not had that time, to be honest with you. Yeah, so, so, you know, the universe works in strange ways. It is what it is. That was sort of my suggestion that sort of 25 years in, there must th this must have been a positive. It must have turned into a positive somehow. And uh, so let's just remind folks, uh, Better Days Coming, uh, an absolutely fantastic album. I mean, Rat Race, probably one of the best rock songs I've heard in five years, honestly. I appreciate um, that. And um, uh, will we see an, um, Winger doing an orchestral or a symphony like some other bands have done, or is that something you would never do? Oh, I would do it. Reb and I played with the Colorado Symphony. I, I orchestrated some of our tunes and stuff. It's really a cool thing. Um, you know, the, my thing with orchestra music is really writing for the orchestra and write a piece of music, and it's a completely different headspace. So. Yeah. You know, the hybrid pop rock concert with strings behind you is a whole other thing. Right. You know, it's really... And, and I, I'm not opposed to it. It's cool. It's just not why I do it. Um, so it is possible that we would do that. Um, but we don't have any plans to do it. I have quite a few arrangements for it just because we did the Colorado Symphony thing. But... Uh, uh, nothing's in the works, no. So, so there you go. So, and then I guess we should send people out to uh, kipwinger dot com, and um, what's the winger one again? It's uh, winger. I forget the the winger one. All of a sudden, winger the band. Dot winger com. the band. That's it. There we go. So winger the band dot com, kipwinger dot com. Kip, thank you very much. It's a, it's been a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, thank you. I appreciate your time, man. Hopefully we'll see you in uh, Montreal or at least somewhere in Canada very soon. I'll, I'm going to call my agent right now and tell him to get us up there. <laughs> you guys have a good one. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye-bye now.